wrong way up. When I'm not um, so let me say something about the second goal of thermodynamics. Here's a, a situation in a room somewhere, perhaps, and uh, of course it's one of these Sesame Street things. I don't know if they still do it, I don't know. It's a long time since I've seen them. It's hard to see which order do those pictures go. Because this is the first, with the wine glass perched on the edge of the table. Second is where it's people have fallen off, and all the wine is starting to splash out. And the third one is where the wine glass is broken, and all the wine is absorbed in the carpet. Now, I should say, this situation is meant to describe something in Newtonian mechanics. So you have lots and lots of particles, and these particles are moving in certain ways, and they attract each other in certain ways. And the thing about Newtonian laws in this context is that they are symmetrical in time. So that anything like this, which goes one direction in time, it would be perfectly consistent with Newtonian mechanics for it to go the other way. So it would be a mess in the ground, and then all the wine suddenly jumping into the glass, which assembles itself and approaches itself on the edge of the table. is perfectly in accordance with Newton's laws, but you never see it. You see things like this, but you don't see things like that. How do we understand that? Well, first of all, we want to say this is, in a little bit more precisely, we say this is called the entropy, which is a measure of disorder, is increasing. So it's less here, a bit more here, and a bit more here. And what is the entropy? Well, Boltzmann, the great Austrian physicist, Ludwig Boltzmann, had a wonderful formula for this, after lots of people were worrying about what this thing meant in terms of context. And this is the formula. S is the entropy. K, well, that's a logarithm, S constant, uh, referred to as Boltzmann's constant, and this is a logarithm, a log, and V is a volume. You have to say, what volume is that? Well, in order to understand that, we have to know what phase space is. What's phase space? Well, phase space is a space of zillions and zillions of dimensions. Well, let's suppose there are uh, a zillion particles in this situation here. I'm not saying I'm going to do a zillion, don't worry about that. Big number, a zillion particles, and each particle has a position, and that position requires three numbers to characterize like this. So three numbers, the position, so three zillion coordinates altogether to tell you where all the particles are, and three more for each particle to tell you how it's moving. But that's the velocity, or you prefer to call it the momentum, which tells you how it's moving. So you have six zillion dimensions. This space here, I haven't drawn it very well because I've only drawn two dimensions, but I'm not very good at drawing six zillion dimensions. You have to think that this space, this is where you really have to use your imagination, has six, we don't really because it doesn't help much. <laughs> it has six zillion dimensions, and each point in this picture represents a possible way that the particles in this room here can be located and, and moving. So all of the particles and all how they're all moving is encoded in a single point in the six zillion dimensional space. Now what are all these compartments here? Those are what are called the coarse graining regions, and they're characterized by the fact that if I take two particles, two points, I should say, in the same region, they represent two <coughs> situations which are indistinguishable with regard to macroscopic parameters. Now that's a little bit vague, but let's not too worry too much about that. Uh, it doesn't make a huge difference if you have a different definition of what macroscopic product means. But basically it's things like what is the, what is the temperature, the density, the direction of motion, the chemical composition, of various things going on over here. So it's the macroscopic parameters which tell you what's going on here, and not the details of where each individual molecule atom might be. Okay, so you lump together all the different ones which look the same. And the volume of that, of course it's a higher dimensional volume, it's not ordinary volume, it's a six million dimensional volume, that volume is V. And this is the formula of entropy. Beautiful formula, it's very simple. Now, what about the second law? The second law tells us that the entropy should be going up. Almost always. Well, you see, suppose we start in some region, that means, say, this picture here, and then the point wanders around somehow, according to the Newtonian mechanics, it's completely determined by the initial starting point. But the thing is, you have to bear in mind that these volumes, okay, they look a bit different in size, 
for the eye, but you have to remember, because of all the six limbs and stuff, they're absolutely stupendously different in size. So this one will have quite a lot of other regions nearby, and it's almost certain that the next region it goes into will be absolutely stupendously larger than the one that it had. The logarithm helps because if the V's chain uh, are stupendously different, the logs aren't all that different. So that's rather nice. That's a more important piece as well. But don't worry about that. Uh, okay, so it finds itself in a bigger volume, and then in a bigger volume, and then in a bigger volume. And this is a way of understanding that the entropy goes up. The only snag with this argument is that it, if you try to use it in the backward direction, and I don't seem to have my transparency for this, but it's not very important. You try to work in the backward direction, you say, what's the most likely way, let's put the other way around, what's the most likely way that that glass found itself up on the perch on this edge of the table? And then you go back and look at this, and you say, well, the most likely way would have been a much bigger region before, and a bigger region before that, and a bigger region before that, because that's, there are far more ways of getting to here from a more bigger entropy state, or a different, bigger volume case. So what it tells you, this argument, is that the most likely way that that glass can touch on the corner is it started as a mess on the ground with a little wine all in the carpet. Suddenly the, the bits of glass jumped up in the air, glued themselves together, the wine miraculously found its way into the glass, and it touched its way across. That's, of course, completely wrong. The right answer is some idiot who'd been drinking too much, who lurched his way and stuck this thing on the edge of the table. And that, the trouble is that that's consistent with the second law. That is what physics tells us would have happened. This argument doesn't give it. What really happened inside of some tiny region that worked its way around like this. So here we have what actually happened and what is predicted to happen according to this argument. In the future of now, in the past, this is what our argument predicts. It's completely wrong. What actually happened is the curve came down. So this is the sort of partial explanation. It would be okay if there wasn't something else which is saying this isn't really a random motion, there's something else going on. So what else is going on? Well, in order to find out, we should go back and back and back. Our picture. Let's get along with you guys for this. The Big Bang. So the Big Bang was a much lower state of entropy than the uh, state now, over here, and certainly lower than this as well. So the, to ensure the entropy continues to go down in the past, we need enormous constraint. Well, I'm going to say constraint on the geometry. Let me leave it there for a moment and try and see, say something more about this. Well, first of all, we have to raise the question of why do we believe in the Big Bang anyway? And one of the most powerful pieces of evidence for the Big Bang, it's such an impressive piece of evidence that on two quite separate occasions it got the Nobel Prize, um, which is the microwave background. If you look in all directions out in space, you find this radiation coming at us, sometimes referred to as the flash of the Big Bang. It's not actually quite the Big Bang that you're looking at. What you're looking at is what happened something like 300,000 years after the Big Bang. But okay, it's pretty early. And this radiation, has, well, first of all, I popped it here, I have to pop it out of this picture from somewhere, but you'll see this curve. And that is the famous Planck curve that Max Planck explained and which started off on the mechanics. And what it indicates is that what you're looking at, if it was the Planck curve, would be something in thermal equilibrium. Well, first of all, let me say this is an extraordinarily the observations fit this curve to an extraordinary degree. See, I've got the error bars, these lines going up and down, tell you the error in the actual observation of how far off they are from this curve, multiplied by a factor of 500. So even the worst one, which is right at the end here, if you divide that by 500, it will be hugging that curve. To the eye, every single observation point is dead on the curve. That means that, well, the curve, what is it? Going this way, we have the, the uh, frequency of the light that you're looking at. Was, and here we have the intensity. When I call it light, it's electromagnetic radiation. But it's, uh, the particular curve we have here is uh, the curve 
for 